in your house, Lord. And Lord, we just ask you to touch the ones who are sick today, Lord. I know there's a lot of people who are sick, just not in this body, but in other bodies, Lord. And we ask you to touch them, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to dwell in us today, Lord. To dwell in this building, to dwell in our hearts, Lord. Let us hear the message that is going to be spoken today, Lord. Let us open our hearts to worship, Lord. Let us clear our minds of anxieties and stresses and things that overwhelm us sometimes, Lord. Let us know that you have overcome this world, Lord. That no matter what we're going through, you're there with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning.
this is a new kind of tradition here at Cornerstone during this time of the year. Like everybody just raise your hand. Your right hand. Turn and look at somebody just wave to them. Good morning. Amen. There should be some people greet this morning. And you may be seated now.
I praise you for your goodness to us. I praise you for your generosity to us, God. And Lord, I pray that in everything that we do, God, we honor you, God. So thank you for this day. Thank you for those who have come to be part of Cornerstone today, God. I pray, God, that you would speak your word to all of our hearts today, God. You would bless us all. And use it to build your kingdom, God. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.
it's a good day to be here, and I welcome you here. Uh, I had dinner with my mom and dad last night, and uh, dad and I were talking to that probably, I don't know if you want me to share this or not, I'm going to share it. Uh, that's the right, that's the pastor and the uh, father of some relations right there. But dad was talking to me, and we got to talking about, uh, about living for the Lord, and, and he's just been such a great example my entire life. I don't remember, uh, there was never a time in my entire life that my dad wasn't serving the Lord, wasn't living for him. Praise the Lord for my mom and dad, godly influences throughout my entire life. You don't know the value of that. It's very valuable. It's very rare. And so uh, dad and I were talking last night. And I don't say a lot. Uh, he used to keep quiet and let my mom do the talking. <laughs> That's not for everybody. But I'm somewhere in between. But, uh, but he was telling me, he said, you know, he said, I got up uh, Tuesday morning after the Alabama game. And he said, and I was driving into work, and I was, as I was driving, as I was driving into work, he said, the Lord began to talk to me. And he said, he began to talk to you about the Alabama game, and he said, he began to tell me, he said, when's the last time that you stayed up with me like that? When's the last time that you stayed up to worship me like that? When's the last time you were that excited about me? When's the last time you came to church and you wondered which team was going to show up? When's the last time that you became so uh, so enthralled in me that it calls that kind of response from you? See, we can be quiet and we can say, oh, I'm not a singer, so I don't sing with me. Oh, I don't really know the songs. But I'm telling you what, man, you're yelling at that TV. You're yelling and you're cheering them on and you're getting excited and you're getting pumped up about something that really will go away someday. And I get excited. I love it. I, I love it. I competed in high school. I played football. I, I ran track some before that. I've done a bunch of things like that. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the competition. I enjoyed the game. Maybe not as much as everybody, but a lot like everybody. Like Eric enjoys it more than I and Jesse, definitely. So, uh, Jesse will yell at the TV. Uh, but, you know, when is the last time that you're that excited? We've had this discussion before. This is not a new discussion. But think about your life. We get so emotionally wrapped up in something. And it's not the main thing. It's not the main thing. Can you imagine going to a concert and going to see your favorite band and you're in the uh, ticket line and you're just fired up about the ticket line. Boy, I love these tickets. These tickets are great. Woo! I'm going to need good seats. And then you go to the main event and you sit there like this. That's what we're doing in life. We're so excited about everything else that we're building kingdoms in places that are not going to be permanent. <laughs> we're building kingdoms. We're, we're storing everything over here. I, I mean, this week's been crazy. Uh, just, I, I extend my sympathy to the Johnson family. Kenneth lost a brother-in-law this week. Unexpectedly, it's been a tough week for me. And I think about that. Life is just, whoo, just short. I went to school. With Tyler Johnson, and, and when he's just a couple years older than me, and I remember playing guitar with him and, and being friends with him, and then he's just gone. And then I had a conversation yesterday with somebody who's on hospice, a friend of the family, and he said, You know, eventually your day comes no matter what age you are, where you're going to die. And I just think, Man, the things that we build up here are just not important. They're just not, they're just, they're just gone. And so, why am I investing so much in what's here when I'm going to live so much more over there? And I'm so excited about football, but I'm not excited about Jesus. I'm not excited about the church. You know, and then I go, oh, I'm just waiting on the right song, or I don't like this song, or I don't like that song. And then I remember that thing that says, you know what? I set the pulse of the pews. I do. And, I tell, and my heart tells my brain what to do, and my brain does it. And what's the center of my heart? Because that's what I'm going to yell for. And that's what I'm going to scream for. And that's what I'm going to get excited about. And I'm just saying, we can use a little more time. Amen. This is a great church. We do some great things here. I, 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 I mean, we baptized people last week, but I could use a little more excitement. Amen. Challenge me. Get me excited. Woo! And that's not even where we're going this morning. So let's just get started. <laughs> You know, there was a song I remember, and it stuck with me. There's a couple of songs that I remember from, like, the 90s era. Uh, I guess that's because I was a teenager then. And, and, and I remember when they stick with me, and I remember there was this one Christian song, and it was called Painting Pictures of Egypt. You might remember that song, Painting Pictures of Egypt? And the word said, I've been painting pictures of Egypt, but I've been leaving out what they lack. The future 
seem so hard and I don't want to go back. Talking about, talking about the children of Egypt. You know, they were in slavery, right? They were in slavery. And they, they had it bad. And then God raises up a leader, Moses. He's going to come out. He's going to bring them out of captivity. And then the first time it gets hard, they said, you know what? At least we ate good back in Egypt. It, 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 at least we were doing this. And they just totally forget that they're stacking bricks every day. They totally forget that they've got slave masters. They totally forget that they have no freedom. And they say, oh, I would rather go back to captivity than to deal with my hardship. And I see that in Christians. And this week as I was, as I was working and I was just thinking about life and I thought, how many times have I seen people get so excited and so on fire for the Lord? Because last week our service here was just on fire. We're baptizing people. We're seeing kingdom work come, become accomplished. We're seeing people get excited. You're in one side. You're out the other. And it's just a great day. And I thought, man, I've been here before. And then how quickly we go back. And we accept average when we can live above average. Yeah. And I was so discouraged this week. I was like, man, times are just tough. Times are just tough. And then I thought to myself, man, so many people are doing good. And I thought about several of you by name. And I won't call you by name this morning. But I thought about this. I said, man, think about that guy. He's just so on fire right now. Think about this guy who wants to serve. And this lady who's doing this praying. And this one's doing this. And I was so excited. And then it hit me. What if we go back? What if we go back? If the children of Israel were tempted to go back, won't we be tempted to go back? And I thought, please, men of this church, you ones who are on fire, you're so excited about the Lord. And, I, and, I, and I'll be honest, we've been doing this read through the Bible, and for the first week, there was a lot of comments and a lot of things happening. And then the second week, it's just been silent. And I'm going, are you still with me, guys? Yeah. One day at a time. We can win this battle. If you miss a day, just pick up. There'll be a day behind. One day is not going to kill anybody. One month is not going to kill anybody. But you got to quit quitting. And as I was looking at it and I was thinking about it, I said, promise me something, man. Promise me that we're just not going back. I don't want to go back. See, I've had difficult times when my walk was, was hard, when I had more questions than answers. Times when my heart was broken, when my spirit was defeated, when my faith was shaken. But in those times, I decided to press on. And I decided to press in. And I decided to encourage myself in the Lord and choose not to obey my emotions, but to keep standing on God's foundations. Because I'm not going to go back. And you guys, you encourage me, you excite me. I get so fired up by you. You're, you're wanting to read the word. You're wanting to consume it. You're saying this year is going to be the year that we run. And then at the same time, I go, we can't go back. So I'm asking you this morning to promise me that we're not going back. You know, I have too much invested in the promised land of God to settle on the opposite side of the Jordan. I fought too hard. Where we are today as a church is because we've chosen to back. And I want to know we aren't going back. When you think you're tired or beaten, it is then that your ability to press on will create your opportunity to push through and it will advance the cause of Christ and allow you to claim new territory. Territory that you've never had before. But you don't claim new territory without fighting. If you think of the children of Israel, when they got to the promised land, it was not wide open for them. Here's your free buffet. What was waiting on them in the promised land? Giants. Amen. Giants. And they didn't get to go around the giants. They didn't get to go around the armies that were out there. They had to go through them. And why would we think that the promises that God has for us, we wouldn't have to go through them? We're saying, God, protect me. God, oh, keep me. And he's saying, pick up your sling and stone because the giants in front of you. He's saying, just press on in. See, it calls the Israelites 40 years in the wilderness and nearly everybody to die because they didn't have enough faith to go through the giants to inherit the promise. And you're saying, God, give me freedom in my family. God, help me lead my family. And he's saying, start slaying the giants. So you've got to fight for your territory. You know, we may have been called to turn the other cheek to one another, but we're not called to turn the cheek to the devil. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. Put on the full armor of God so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, so we're not fighting each other, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm.
commandments. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able, what, not to run it, but to stand your ground. And having done everything to stand. Man, I, I think about people here in the week. Think about people who's going through hard times, Reagan Johnson losing his brother. Chase, I thought about you this week. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. It's been difficult, I know. But what the devil meant to kill you, God is going to use to build you. And the devil meant it to harm you, but God's going to turn it for your good. <laughs> you just fight. You sharpen your sword one day at a time, and when you get tired, Chase, I'm going to fight alongside of you. And we're going to come around you. And I'm going to fight for you. See, we're promised the battle belongs to the Lord. But sometimes we just have to fight. I saw this quote and I thought about you. It says, whenever <coughs> God means to make a man great, he always breaks him in pieces first. Amen. But he's a real good God to put things back together. And it's something about when something's broken and it's mended back together that is stronger than it was. So promise me this, men. Promise me no matter how difficult it gets, no matter how hard, no matter how hard the days are that we see lying ahead of us, no matter if it gets where we feel like we're walking alone, that we will not give up and walk away. That we'll do the things that we've been doing to get the results we've been getting, and then we'll do more. When the disciples began following Jesus, and they saw all his miracles, and spent all their time traveling with him, they thought there was no way that they would ever deny him. Would you turn to your, to your Bibles, Matthew chapter 26. <coughs> Matthew chapter 26. Give you just a minute to flip there, or click there, or whatever we do. Matthew chapter 26. The disciples, when we look at them at the beginning of their relationship with Jesus, they're new to this plan, that they do not ever think that they're going to back away or they're going to walk away. All right, Matthew 26, start from verse 31. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you in Galilee. And Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Sounds pretty confident to me. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. See, it sounds good. It sounds really good. And I hear all of you, and I, and, I, and I know you're with me, and I believe you're with me, but I hear you, and you say, Matt, even if we have to die with you, we're, not, we're, we're going to keep chasing after the Lord. And everybody agrees, and you say, yes, and it's just like they said, even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will not disown you. But notice how confident Peter is. He's almost offended that Jesus would tell him that he of all people would deny him. Think about Peter's personality. It doesn't mix well with being told anything. Much less that he would deny him. And Peter says, I will die before I disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. And I believe in their heart that they truly believe that. To see their faith hadn't been put through the fire yet. Man, it is so easy to make a bunch of statements and to claim a bunch of things before you've been through the fire. When you had lost anything, You'll say a lot of things. But the reality is when the fire comes, it tests you. It's the fire that purifies silver. See, when silver is heated, all of the elements that are impure rise to the top. They call it the dross. And then what they do is as that's heated and it goes to the top, they skim that off. And then they heat a little more. And then they skim that off. And they heat a little more. And they skim that off. And they get all of those impurities away. Why? So that they can have pure silver. And that's what trials do to us. It's the fire in our lives that shows us where we're weak. See, the fire ends up heating up for the disciples later on. Of course, we know Judas, he abandons Jesus, which I doubt he was ever really sold out to him to begin with. I mean, 
we have a record of him uh, in the house of Martha and Mary where he's upset that they've broken the alabaster box because why? He said, oh, it could have been sold for a year's wages. He, he wanted that money because he kept the bag. And it says he helped himself to some of it from time to time. But the other 11 had been faithful. Let me show you another example where they're ready to lay down their lives for Jesus. Let's look at John. Flip over John chapter 11. It's the story of Lazarus. And Jesus has received the message that Lazarus is sick. All right? John chapter 11, verse 6. So when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back. So Jesus is getting ready to go back, and they said, look, they're going to kill you if you go back. They tried to kill you the last time that we were there. Now go on down to verse 14. Verse 14. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Because they didn't understand what he was saying. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him again. He says, I'm going to go back. And then Thomas, now this is the doubt. This is the one that later is known as the doubt. He says to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Let us also go that we may die with him. This is the disciple forever known as the doubter. But before the fire comes, he is ready to lay his life down. Sounds to me like Thomas had made his mind up. Sounds to me like he was fully persuaded in whom Jesus was. Yet the real test of fire had to came here. See, it's easy to be confident before the fire came. It's easy to think, that's where I'm going. Oh, I, I'm dedicated to you, Jesus. But have you ever been in one of those situations where you were fired up about the Lord? And then something came and then you realized you were so far away from him and you hadn't made the right decisions and it had been a chain reaction in your life where it was just one thing after another, after another, after another to where you were like, and I don't even know if I can see Jesus if I look for him. I mean, have you ever been in that situation before where you said, I'll, I'll, I'll never turn away. And then the fire just bears down so hot and you lose one person and then you don't just lose one, but you lose, then you lose another, you lose another. You haven't seen the church in years. All of a sudden things are going crazy and you don't know what to do. You say, I don't even know how to pray anymore. Your spirit's defeated. See, it kind of happens like that sometimes. That fire kind of separates us. And it kind of shows who we really are because our foundations just aren't deep enough. And see, so what happens to Thomas is he's been committed to the Lord. Thomas has been fired up about the Lord. He's been ready. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Jesus is arrested. Jesus is arrested, and then he's taken to the cross, right? And then Jesus hangs there, and he dies in front of him. And during this time, Peter denies knowing Jesus three different times. Why? Because fire came. And then his shame leaves, in his shame, he leaves the scene weeping bitterly. And the other disciples go into hiding. And Judas, he, he has betrayed Jesus, so he goes and he hangs himself. And only one disciple out of twelve is found at the cross. There's John. He's there. These are the people who lived with Jesus. These are the people who touched Jesus. These are the people who leaned up against Jesus as they ate. These are the people who truly knew him. And only one out of twelve can handle the fire. See, trials shake even the confidence. You think I don't get shaken? I think you need to shake me today that you call me Chase. He shook me a little bit when you called me that day. I think you didn't shake me when Kim's called me the other day. You think it didn't shake me when different things happen? You don't think it shakes me? Yes, it shakes even the most confident. And we remember how confident Thomas was. When they were going to see Lazarus, remember he explained to the disciples, he said, let's go, we'll die with him. But where's Thomas now? Where is he now? Now that Jesus died, where is confident Thomas? Look at John chapter 20. Look there. John chapter 20. He was so confident. He was like, we'll just go and we'll die with Jesus. And probably in the back of his mind, he thought somewhere Jesus will never let us die. Jesus will never die. But I believe we'll just go and we'll die with him. It sounded really good at the time. 
until Jesus was going to die, and then there was no time. Look, John chapter 20, verse 24 and 25. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And this is after Jesus had been raised from the dead. And he says, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, and I put my finger where the nails were, and I put him, his hand, uh, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. What happened to Compton and Thomas? See, we get excited about Jesus. We get fired up about Jesus. But our temptation to go back to where we once were is so strong that when trials come and fire happens, we retreat back to familiar fortresses instead of pressing on in the promises. Look here, verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And, and though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. See, trials, they shake even the most confident. Trials make you lose your confidence in who you thought you really were. Have you been there before? Where you said, oh, I'm, I'm strong enough to handle this. I'm strong enough. I can do it on my own. I can make it. I, my relationship with the Lord is good enough. Thomas had been so bold. Now he has been reduced to a doubting skeptic. See, everything he knew about Jesus came crashing down when Jesus was placed on the cross and died. And while it changed everything about Thomas, about who Thomas was in that moment, the reality is it had only affirmed who Jesus was. The cross, it changed everything for Thomas, but it didn't change anything about Jesus. He was still who he said he was. And see, Thomas, he had been so, he had been so passionate, he had been so confident, and now he's like, hey, listen, unless I see his hands, Unless I put my fingers in the scars, that's, pretty, that's a pretty crass statement, really. Unless I put my fingers in his nails, unless I put my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe that it's Jesus. What happened to your faith, Thomas? <laughs> you were bold. See, we tend to flee when the fire heats up because we can't understand why Jesus would allow things to happen to us or others. But in those difficult times, it never changes who Jesus is. Or what his purpose is. And what's what I love about this? If you look at that last bit of scripture there, when Thomas needed confidence more than ever, Jesus showed up. Isn't it amazing that when Thomas was at his lowest, Jesus came through a locked door to say, I'm here. How many of you have been down to your last? You've been down to nothing. And then you're laying there at night, and you're like, God, I just can't deal anymore with what's happening. And he shows up. He comes through the barriers that we put in place to deliver a message of hope. And so Thomas is there, and he's broken, and he's, he's skeptical. And he says, oh, I just have to put my hands in. I have to put my fingers in the nails. I have to put my hand in his side. And Jesus comes through the locked door. Jesus came through the barrier that Thomas had put up to keep everyone out. And Thomas said, I need to touch his hands. I need to feel his side. And Jesus comes through the locked door to bring his presence to Thomas' doubt. And then Jesus gives Thomas exactly what he asked for. Have you ever noticed that? That Jesus quotes Thomas verbatim. And Jesus wasn't there when Thomas said, Come on. You want to talk about the power of God when he knows your cries before he even arrived on scene. Maybe it's just the fact that he was always with Thomas even when Thomas didn't know he was there. Amen. And maybe when you're in doubt and you're in trouble and you think, oh, I don't have anything. What can I do? Then, oh, I'm just going to go back to what I know. And Jesus says, oh, I'm still here. Just, and then Jesus looks at him and he says, hey, Thomas, 
why don't you come over here and put your fingers in the middle? Hey, Thomas, why don't you come over here and put your hand in my side? And so the doubter becomes the believer. He said, I need to touch his hand. I need to feel his side. And Jesus comes through and gives him exactly what he asked for. See, it's Jesus showing up in unlikely places. Why? To bring his children back. I mean, I've heard of people who were down to their last dollar, who were doing drugs in hotel rooms, who was places that they shouldn't have never been, doing things that they shouldn't have never done. And then they were in a hotel room and opened up a drawer and found a Gideon Bible. And they found Jesus in the most unlikely places. Why? Because he comes to where you're at. That's what he talks about. He says, I'll leave the 99 in the comforts of my field to go after the one. It's because I want the one. I want to bring them back to the flock. I want to bring them back to my safety. See, it's Jesus. He's showing up in unlikely places to bring his children back. Now, so we talked about Thomas, but now let's look at Peter. Peter had denied him. But Peter was there with the disciples when Jesus showed up. So Peter, he witnesses this with Thomas. But where does he go from here? Peter had denied Jesus. He probably felt like he wasn't really worthy to serve in the same capacity as before. So Peter does what most of us do. He went back to what was comfortable for him. He goes back. But back to where? He goes back to fishing. Now Jesus said, Peter, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He wasn't supposed to go back fishing. That wasn't his life anymore. He wasn't a fisherman anymore. He was now a servant of Jesus the most high. But see, he failed and he thought he no longer had purpose. But now he's going back to fish. And look here at John chapter 21, verse 22. After Jesus appeared again to his disciple by the Sea of Galilee, and it happened this way, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. They all go back to what they know. And he says, I'm going out to fish. And Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, and they got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. See, they went, this story sounds so familiar. It's exactly like how they were found the first time. And they go back to familiar places because what do we run? We run to familiar fortresses when we don't know what else to do. When we fail the Lord, we go back to what we've known. We go backwards instead of forward. Instead of pressing in, we retreat. Verse 4, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off. And he jumped in the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. Now let's stop there. How many of you have ever seen the movie Forrest Gump? You remember, I, I pictured this like that. Uh, the boat is coming in and he looks up on the dock. He says, hey, there's Lieutenant Dan. And what's he doing? Whoosh! And the boat crashes on into the shore. It's pretty funny. But, but the excitement on Forrest's face reminds me of what the excitement must have been on Peter. He says, forget this. Forget everything else. There's Jesus. There's where I'm going. And he leaves it all behind. And he gets in the water. Because what? The boat couldn't move fast enough to get him there. <laughs> he was excited about Jesus' arrival. Look here. I may have finished eating.
person, but you're not that person. And if you'll ever notice that once you come out of something and you get in with Jesus, when you go back to that, it just feels like some shabby shack that you're just taking comfort in, but it ain't where you belong. You're leaving kingdoms to go stay in sheds. It's like this. is in Jesus does what he will do in all of us. He seeks Peter out again. He finds him in the same place where he first found him. And then the beauty of it is he reinstates him for his purpose. Jesus didn't beat Peter down for his mistakes. He just encouraged him to fulfill his purpose. And that's what Jesus is doing for us. He is encouraging us to fulfill our purpose. And he, notice he didn't say that Peter went and he found Jesus and he fell down before him and he brought what were all of his trouble. No, it says Jesus found Peter. Because remember where Jesus told him? He said, remember, he didn't choose me. I chose you. You had value. Look here. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, you love me more than me. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lamb. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And when you told anybody something three times, it meant the utmost importance. It was almost disrespectful to that person to ask him that many times. But Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. He said, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Don't go fish. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and leave you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. And you know what? From that moment on, Peter followed him. There was never a question in Peter's mind after that. There was never a question in any of the disciples' mind. They never turned back. They never left. They never retreated again. You don't see any record again of them turning back and looking another way because they had seen Jesus overcome death and they were willing now to embrace it. See, you say, Pastor, you don't understand. I've gone too far back the other way. My life has hit rock bottom. And I will tell you what I heard recently. Rock bottom is a perfect place to lay foundation. Rock bottom is the perfect place to build up. I mean, if you feel like you're at rock bottom, there's really no other place to go but up. Anything's an improvement. Why would I lie in the gravel when I was made for the mountain? See, it's so easy to go back and give up. The disciples had been with Jesus. They had leaned against them, but they were still tempted to go back to their old ways. To hide when they were scared. But once they came through the, the trial, once they saw Jesus after the cross, never again would they flee to save their own life. Never again would they run away from persecution. No, they would embrace it. Many of them following the same path Jesus followed all the way to the cross. The disciples lived after Christ's ascension with no rear view mirror. Why can't we live that way? Well, we're not looking back at yesterday. Have you come to your place to the place in your life, we're going back. It's just not an option anymore. And I'm not advocating this morning that you have to work for your salvation. But the least we can do is live now. Amen. To be who we said. There's a poem that goes like this. It says, when things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the, flood, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learn. And many a fellow turns about when he might have won, had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night came down how close he was to the golden crown. See, success is a failure that's turned inside out. The silver tint and the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It might be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse that you must not quit. I wonder as Joshua entered the promised land 
after wandering in the desert for 40 years. I wonder if when people began to complain, if he ever looked at them with passion burning and said, what I say to you this morning, he promised you he ain't going back. He had wandered in those deserts for 40 years, and the, all because of everybody else's lack of faith. And I wonder if when they started to complain, he, he started feeling like Moses, and he said, just promise me. We have too much invested moving forward to fall back to where we were. Our flames have burned too hot to embrace a dismal glow. And we've sowed in heartache, invested in tears, and surrendered our hearts to Jesus. And as Randy comes this morning, I ask you this. If you come this far with Jesus, would you just promise me that we're not going back? Just promise me that it's still going to burn bright. That it's still going to be hot. That you're still going to love it. And if you say, well, Pastor, I'm in the place this morning and I went back. I failed. I know it. I should be doing something different. I promised him a lot of things that I didn't do. Just remember, rock bottom is a great place to build foundation. And God wants to dig you down before he builds you up. Because if you don't dig down first, you'll never stand once he begins to build you up. God has a purpose. And it's more than these walls can hold. But we can't turn back and run. We can't retreat to familiar fortresses. We have to embrace what he has. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm asking you to fan the flame. I'm asking you to burn brighter. See, the newness of the new year is already starting to wear off. Maybe you've already failed at some of the commitments that you said you were going to do. See, there's a day where we quit quitting and we stand up and we do what we were called to do. And we tell our body what it's going to do instead of letting our mind tell us what we're going to do. We dictate what we do. We choose. You'll get up in the morning and you'll go to work. When you get up in the morning and find your work, you'll get up in the morning and you'll make sure you get the kids to where they need to go. But will it be important enough to embrace the cross before you leave. As they sing this morning, can we just give our hearts to the Lord and say, God, on this second Sunday in January, Lord, continue to fan the flame. Thank you, back.
emotions define your response. Do not let emotions define your response. The way you feel is a liar. That's why we don't we live by faith and not by sight. When we live by sight, we say, oh, that looks big. I don't think I can climb it. When we live by faith, we're already three feet up and moving on. You can't go by how we feel. You get up and you say, oh, I feel sad today. Okay. You get up and say, oh, I feel bad today. I feel disappointed today. I don't feel like I can do it today. Okay, God hasn't changed. The God that was there when you felt good, when you felt confident, is the same God that's there when you feel sad and you don't know what's going to go. But see, the devil wants to play on our emotions to make us feel like we can't conquer what Jesus has already said. You've already conquered it. You've already conquered it. Don't let him lie to you. God, your Father's not whispering in your ear defeat. He's whispering victory. Close your eyes. All heads bowed this morning. Is there anyone here that says, I've not surrendered my life to the Lord, but I want to live for Him. I know I'm missing something. There's holes in my life that I can't feel. There's things in my life that I can't conquer. There's, there's difficulty and there's pain, but I want to get through. I'm telling you this morning, go to Jesus. Would you come this morning? They're going to sing just a little bit more, but would you come this morning? Would you let us gather around you? Would you let us pray for you? Would you let us lead you to Jesus? Those who love you, lead you to the throne. Say, lead you to Jesus. And say, sing. The altar is open here.